Welcome to SAT Interviews with your host, Farai Muvuti. This week, I sit down with William Sajiti, a serial entrepreneur and innovator, and the current CEO of Academy of Robotics. We get to sit down and explore his innovations, his future plans, and more importantly, where he sees the world going in as far as Africa is concerned when it comes to technology. He makes a few recommendations that I think will be quite interesting. More importantly, quite intriguing. We get to tour his facilities, and I'm sure you will find it as interesting and as fascinating as my team and I did. Enjoy this episode of SAT Interviews with your host, Farai Mufuti. Athena. Welcome, William. I have connected to all autonomous vehicles in the fleet. There are no known issues at the moment, but I am having difficulty with the 5G connection. Would you like to see my logs relating to this issue? In 2021, we launched a unique technology we had been working on for years. Some of Europe's first street-legal self-driving cars, which drive themselves and then autonomously deliver packages. Safety and absolute control of vehicles being paramount. The challenge was to make some of the most advanced safety technology in the industry, but make it so simple that absolutely anybody could use it with very little training. So rather than I tell you about this technology, I'm going to let it introduce itself. Athena. Hello, my name is Athena, the artificial intelligence responsible for monitoring your self-driving vehicle network. From here you will be able to see anything your vehicles on the road can see in real time. You can use the command chair to take instant control of any of the vehicles in the fleet. You can access diagnostics, logs, or any part of all our systems. To do this, all you have to do is ask me the right question. I can be deployed anywhere, anytime and run on 100% renewable energy. I exist to be your assistant and will be there when I am required. It's an awesome pleasure to have you today, William. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you very much for coming. Well, I should be saying we are grateful to you for hosting us. <laughs> because for context sake, guys, today we have come over to your parts of the world, your neck of the hoods, where mm -hmm. you currently have all your facilities and what you're currently working on. Now, before I go into that great detail, which well, there'll be a fantastic tour to show you, I want to know, William, how do we get to this stage, William? So, that's a... How much time do you have? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, crazy story. So, I grew up in Zimbabwe, Harare. Right. Uh, I grew up mostly in Greyston Park. Um, and I went to Greyston Park Primary. Right. And then I went to Oriole Boys High in Chizzy. Okay. And then Spessis College. And then when I was a 16, I went to a special school in Harare called NIT, National School of Information Technology, something like that. Right. Um, where I did my essentially degree equivalent okay. um, of advanced computing. And it was called Network Centered Computing at the time. So I had an early affinity for computers and computing. However, I also grew up in a very traditional family. So right. I would spend a lot of my holidays going, you know, rural areas, right. Komosha, right. I should yeah. say, uh, yeah. Yeah. staying with grandma, grandpa, herding cattle, the kids and stuff. Um, right. uh, little known fact, I can play Mbira better than most people ever come across. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. yeah, I started when I was five. Right. So yeah, so, so that contrast of understanding both worlds of like growing up in Greystone Park and then going to rural areas and stuff, uh, that gave me a unique perspective in the world. And right. I think my, I'd call it a cornerstone memory, is that the kids who are in the rural areas, you know, will come from Greystone Park on holiday. And while on holiday, we finish our sort of holiday period, but they're staying looking after the cattle and many didn't go to school. Right. And the thing that separated me and them was just education. And that helped me understand the true value of right. Education, you know, we're just all people trying to find our way, right? right? So, yeah, I then made this thing to always try and learn and be better because I saw the, how that educational gap could change people who pretty much grew up in the same country, drank the same water, ate the same food, but there was this sort of gap. And so I hyper-optimized myself to maximize the accelerator pedal on just progress through education. Wow. So, so uh, you, you, you're growing up in Zimbabwe, clearly, mm -hmm. yeah? Tell us about the transition between Zimbabwe to then eventually moving to the UK. How does that come about? Uh, no, so I think at the time, I think it's when the farm invasion started in Zimbabwe. And my right. parents said, um, 
maybe it wasn't the best thing for me to stay in Zimbabwe at the time because no. of complexity. Right. And so, yeah, off I was sent to England with uh, 300 pounds, which yeah. my parents wanted back the tight couple. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and so I just started working the most useless job. I think I was selling windows and doors. And then even as a cleaner and then in a club called Legends Nightclub in Sutton, I think it was called. So right. yeah, yeah, just a, a few odd jobs like everybody, just trying yeah. to find my way. Right. Um, and it wasn't until... I then got headhunted, trained as a stockbroker when I was right. about 18, 19. And how does this happen? Surely it oh, can't be just random. Chaos. It actually was because I didn't know what I even wanted. You know, you're yeah, just yeah, doing your yeah. thing. And then I found I had an affinity for fixing problems. I think that started maybe with just fixing computers, maybe. And I noticed that could be extended to real world problems, um, right. such as a business is trying to do this thing. Right. Um, and then I was trained in you know, essentially door-to-door -door selling of windows and doors, which led to door-to-door -to -door knocking off selling outdoor advertising and got an understanding of business. And then something right. bothered me thinking, I think I can do this, you know. And there's a bit of a problem in the space of every news is these yellow pages directories. There must be a way to go digital. And then I started my first startup. That's about 19 at the time. Is this called, one, two, one, two? Yes, one, two, one, three registration. Two, called, right. yeah. It was, it was uh, for those who don't know, it's... Um, there was a time, believe it or not, when building a website was very complicated. Yeah. Web builders didn't exist. You'd have to find some guy. Um, and it was really complicated. Right. Take my word for it. Yeah. So I found a way to automate using technology, the ability to buy a domain and then have a website automatically built. This is before the rise of Google being the juggernaut we know today. And with right. this, that was my first startup in automating technology. And someone thought it was a great idea and they bought it. And right. that was my first exit. I think I was 20 at the time. Right. And then and so, I started it again. And so how do you go, so, do, so you, you don't get any investment into this. You just no. build it from scratch, no. right? And then, of course, you, you know, your first technology mm. is, is, is bought. Yeah. I can imagine the kind of confidence that it created. And with that background in sales, how does this lead into your next venture? I, I think that the key thing is, I think there's an advantage in having grown up in Africa. I actually think it's why Elon Musk is so efficient as well. Mm -hmm. Where when you grow up in Zimbabwe, Africa, in most places, we don't have that first world safety net model in our head, mm -hmm. where if you're going to take a risk, it's you will sink or swim. There is no bank of mum and dad will support you. There is no, uh, this bank will give you a loan. It's right. just, you're going to do it. And you will, there's only one narrative. You have to And succeed. you created most of your success. Too. Uh, yeah, because there is no, and it's kind of something I hear uh, some, what do you call them? Yeah, the sort of the veteran entrepreneurs say, yeah. say I'll call them crazy statements like, oh, oh, yeah, it's fine to fail. No, I don't know any. Ask Elon Musk if he wants to fail any of his startups. Ask Steve Jobs if he wants to fail in the startup. Never. Um, and I think the true sort of lesson I learned from Africa is that, no, when we start something, failure is not an option. You, you, you'd rather die on the street of starvation, <laughs> keep your company alive. Um, and ask any entrepreneurs actually did it because I think someone famously said, the thing that separates winners and losers is those who persevere are the ones who persevere past the point that most rational people would quit. Well, it's funny because it kind of leads me to my next question. Uh, your, your, your time when you went through, through to uh, Dragon's Den. Mm -hmm. For the purpose of context, Dra Dragon's Den is a program on the BBC where you get to pitch an idea. And your idea, you, when you went in, you pitched your idea. Mm -hmm. And they didn't seem to, you know, they found it quite challenging to understand it uh, as, as far as I, I understood that. But you didn't let that deter you. You went out and eventually got other countries to buy the very service that you had sold here. How sure. was that experience? For sure. Um, so dragons, investors, these are all just people. Some mm -hmm. person will say, this is a great idea, this was a great, terrible idea, and they hated my idea. They thought I should be kicked out. <laughs> so for context, I had this crazy idea to put digital advertising, which is solar powered, right on bins and then make them smart bins. They could tell you when they're full. They could um, do all sorts of display digital advertising. And these aren't just ugly bins. These are like really beautiful, the Ferrari of bins, yeah, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. And they hated it. Um, interesting, this was the same year that Steve Jobs gave us the iPhone. Right. And so to the dragons, I remember said, it's overdeveloped, who wants a smart bin anyway? Yeah. But if you go on the streets of London today, nearly every second bin is a, a smart, smart bin, bin. <laughs> that crushes and compacts rubbish and lets the local authority know when it's, when it's full. It was just a bit ahead of its time. But, but I did not at the time, I was not for a second um, discouraged. I just went on with it and because it had to be done and I did it. And there's something, something quite interesting about the ideas that I've seen you come up with after. You seem to have an interest in alternative energy, solar. You know, for example, the bin, if I'm correct, it was powered by solar. Completely. Right? And 
so is is that tied to sort of like your connection to to you know Africa or, or Zimbabwe in particular, where climate change is a challenge, or is this something that you sort of found, found to be a better solution, which in the long term would be much more efficient? I think for the most part, solar may not be the most efficient for a lot of implementations with how we use our tech on Earth. No. But I think I'm more aligned with the principle of leave no trace. Okay. Um, um, maybe not create something new all the time. Right. Adapt it because if you follow how nature works, nature doesn't make something new from scratch. It evolves it, it evolves from it, a right. previous stage. It reuses it. And similarly, if you drop this bus in the bottom of the ocean, bottom of the ocean. Do you know what happens? It's not going to just rot. Go away for 100 years, come back. There's fish living in it. It's, called, it's been repurposed by nature. And that's the logic. This bus used to be a giant diesel bus and we cut it open, made it a vehicle transporter. It's running entirely on solar power. There's a screen here and our entire tech team can be monitoring our AVs on the move on the solar power bus. So we just repurposed it. So. I suppose when I add stuff like solar, it's about leaving no trace and sustainability because I don't think we have the enough resources on Earth to keep building more metal machines and all these things. But we don't have to just reassign it, use it again, because nature does it. So why don't we? Because that's four billion years of past experience and evolution that, that that's, we can tap on for experience. And that's all I'm doing, just trying to play my part to, to effect change, but with as little impact as possible. All right. And so, interestingly, you, you know, in this bus that we're in, for context purposes, like, you guys will get a full tour as well as we have. But we're sitting in a bus that you have created. And the idea from uh, what I understand is that this is a place for you to work. It's sort of like your workstation. Your tech team and your engineers can sort of come in and sit through and sort of work uh, and build uh, designs and ideas around, you know, how you can better innovate. Sure. You know, how do we end up coming here? Why not an ordinary office? I mean, everyone does the same thing. So I actually designed this for the Royal Air Force in the UK. Right. So what happened is we were trying to find a way to optimize their personnel. These are highly skilled personnel who do really complex jobs. Mm -hmm. And some of these air bases tend to be a thousand acres long. And you notice just on my site here, I have yeah, a yeah. former military base. Yeah. It takes 20 minutes to go from <laughs> one side to another. Yeah. So if there's an emergency and there's very busy people, the last thing you need to be doing is running errands halfway across the site will takes you half an hour, one way or half another, another way. And so they needed a solution and we devised or we found a way to get our self-driving cars to be able to do this securely, get the super intelligent dumb robot to do it. It's very smart, yeah. but it does one simple task there when it's needed, out of the way when it's not. So to be able to do this, one of the things was you don't want to be sitting in the back of a van um, with a little tent and engineers there tapping away because you don't really want to integrate into their systems. You have to do this securely. Mm -hmm. And so it came to me that I've seen a lot of AV companies or competitors. Um, they have fleets of, of their AVs and they have teams of people in vans. And they're, I thought there's got to be a better way. Yeah. And so I thought, what happens if we take the comfort and the luxury and the warmth of our office they're with us. Um, we can do this using a bus. Let's get a luxury coach, hollow it out. An old luxury coach. Cost, I think the coach itself costs less than five grand. Dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. um, considering, I mean, that's the price of a little Ford Focus or yeah. something. <laughs> um, and then we just repurposed it. And in the space of three months, we built it so it's a secure space where, believe it or not, the cars actually drive in here and they're transported here. So not only do we take the cars in there, take the engineers and they have a nice, comfortable place to work. So were we to deploy in northern Scotland or Gweru, mm. for example, in Zimbabwe. Um, we wouldn't necessarily need to be worried about how are we going to connect the internet across? No, just take the entire lab with you. So this is a lab and engineering workshop on wheels where engineers and individuals and safety drivers can be housed and work in comfort. Well, thank you so much, William, for that. So on to my next question. I think one of the one of the questions that I have had, I mean, looking at, you know, we've covered you since, like I said earlier, November 2020. We sort of followed the growth, as it were. And one of the things that interested me the most is, you know, coming from your childhood, you're with your story, looking at where Africa is now and the, you know, dark story that we hear about sort of like where, you know, where things are in terms of the economy and so forth. My question is, what are the so sort of solutions you've seen that, you know, you can try and you've tried to implement to sort of help along with that story and to change that narrative, as it were? So I had a sort of, um, I think the first thing about developing countries is it's important that they're very smart people there. And when they innovate, 
I think an important thing they should try to do is innovate for their country, not innovate to mimic. What I mean by this is you'll find someone might think, hey, smartphones are cool. I'm going to make smartphones for Africa. And if you think about it, smartphones are maybe not the technology. Apple does it really well. Let them do smartphones. Yeah. Samsung, do it, they do cheap. Well, let them do that. What problem was Apple trying to solve? We get it. But what problem are you trying to solve locally? And so I think when we innovate in outside of United Kingdom or Europe, it's important we innovate to solve the local problems we have there. Right. Because the smartphone, they do it really well. You don't have to do, I can do it too. No. Um, similarly, you likely won't see the self-driving car in Africa anytime soon because it's optimized for a European environment. Right. If I was to do an African car, believe me, that car will go through potholes. It's designed yep. right. specifically for that environment. And I think that is the right way to go. But... Right. I do have a sort of a, a little side project I did where I realized that the time I grew up in Africa, at least, um, a lot of kids would learn under a tree. Mm -hmm. um, so they'd walk for hours to go to school. And then when they go to school, the, there might be a giant tree, the teachers there in the class, and because there weren't enough classes at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but what was really interesting was this. The people learn under a tree, but sometimes there's no teacher because they might not have been paid or, or whatever reason. Yeah. And they're gathering under this tree, maybe trying to teach themselves. I thought, there's got to be a way to bridge this gap using technology. Right. So for the audience, this is kind of wild. So mm -hmm. I had a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. It is a known fact that second-hand phones are easy to get now in yeah, most, yeah. most of the third world. I mean, of course. all the new phones yeah, they become old and they end up being dumped in Africa because it's cheaper for recycling. The point is they're older phones there. Right. So I never would have passed my artificial intelligence and robotics degree courses without the power of YouTube. Right. Because the courses were complicated, really hard. So I had to watch right. it again and again on YouTube. And I thought, so what if we just get the education to the smartphones? Right. So here we Then created a new type of technology where I got a microcomputer I designed, mm -hmm. which we embed into a tree. Right. And it broadcasts a Wi-Fi signal that gives you access only to maths, English and science videos. It is called Trees of Knowledge. I then made it open source, put it online, and anyone right now can download the schematics and put an educational hub full of content anywhere. And how uh, do they find this? Uh, it's free. Just Google Trees of Knowledge and literally Google automatically autofill Trees of Knowledge and you put my name, William, there, it'll, it'll come up. And, and what's, been, what's been the feedback since you launched it? There are quite a lot of inputs. Um, it's a type of tech I don't quite have time to, to pursue myself yet. Yeah. So self-driving cars for me is my sacrifice upon the altar of capitalism, where the world works the way it works. Yeah. And self-driving cars, yeah, it will do well. But when it does well, then I'll revisit this type of technology where right. we make free education. But trees of knowledge, go on the Google machine, type in trees of knowledge and put the name William in front. You find the schematics, the operating system, designs. It's all free online. There's quite a lot out there, actually. Um, and yeah, people use it. Well um, so for me, I just create the tech and I put it out there. If, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But it's, it's a sort of a step in that direction. But most importantly, it's free and open source. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Now, so leading into, into sort of like the final conclusions of, of uh, my, my, my interview questions, I think the question one would want to, to know is, what's the next big idea? <laughs> <laughs> so... For, what, what should we anticipate? So for this bus to exist, there's 18 months of pre-work. Mm -hmm. And I think the world only found out when it was done. There is something else I've been working on for the last 18 months. And in four weeks, everyone gets to find out. In four weeks? There are <laughs> Well, Okay, great. So we all anticipate that. And as a final question, perhaps, is uh, as they, there's probably possibly a, you know, a young child, a young boy growing up, wherever they're growing up, be it in America, whatever the case may be, and they want to go into tech, they want to understand tech, this is the future after all. What is your word of advice? Why? Before you do anything, it's really important you know why. Are you doing it because everyone in China is doing it, it's popular there? Are you doing it because, oh, Apple's doing it, I'm going to do it too? So for me to do everything I did, I literally made a nearly 20-year plan and realized where is technology going next? I've just sold a company. Do I sail off in the sunset and buy a yacht or something? And I realized, mm, I still want to innovate. But then I realized for me, the future of tech on earth was probably going to be artificial intelligence and robotics. And I went back to university as a mature student at 31 to study 
just to be able to better understand the tech or to upgrade my geek credential credentials. <laughs> um, so after I upped my Greek geek yeah. credentials, um, I was then able to start innovating and do all this because it was very, very specific. So the most important question I think for anyone is why are why? you doing it? Understand why. And when you find the answer, don't answer it for why you're doing it today. Because by the time you get into it, by the time you pick up the year, just, the world has changed three years later. So that thought process you're doing should be optimized for three years from now, not for today. Final question. I, I know you put your, your, your business on the market now. Um, care to tell us the value? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. If you, um, who, know, who, know who knows these things? My, my job is mm. to try and create the best technology we can that is simple, non-intrusive. They just solve problems, you know, because yeah. the world's a very horrible place. Um, and maybe it should just Tech should be there to make life that little bit easier. That's yeah. all. And that's all we're trying to do. And if people like it, they'll buy it. Mm -hmm. If they don't, they won't. And, and I'm okay with that. I don't have to be the richest man in the graveyard. Well, reports suggest 150 million. I think with that re in that regard, I see why you're not worried too much about <laughs> what the market is saying, isn't it? <laughs> I just, I, I, who, know, who knows these things? I'll, I'll, I'll take it from you. I <laughs> well, thank you so much for making time for us. It's been a great ex experience for us, to, especially learning and getting acquainted to a lot of the technology that you're building. It's been very inspiring for my team and I. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for tuning in to this week's episode of SAT Interviews with me, your host, Farai Mavuti. I hope to see you again next week. Take care.